This is the first webinar in Western New York Prism's Fall Webinar Series. My name is Emily Thiel, and I am Western New York Prism's Education and Outreach Program Manager. So just to start off, I would like to introduce my organization, Western New York Prism. This stands for the Western New York Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. It is a bit of a mouthful. And we are one of eight prisms in New York State. New York State is really, really lucky in that our entire state is covered by these invasive species management organizations. So every corner of the state has some focus of invasive species management going on. A lot of states don't have that focus. So again, New York State is really lucky to have that. Western New York Prisms region covers the eight westernmost counties of New York State. And this includes Allegheny, Cattaraugus, Chautauqua, Erie, Genesee, Niagara, Orleans, and Wyoming counties. And while we work on a lot of different things related to invasive species management, our mission can essentially be boiled down to minimizing the harm caused by invasive species. And we do this in coordination with a wide variety of partner organizations. We often work with New York State Parks, New York State DEC, Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper, Western New York Land Conservancy. We work with Erie County Parks. I'm looking at some of our attendees here. We also work with the Soil and Water Conservation Districts throughout our region. So we work with a lot of different partner organizations, and that's some of what makes us so strong. In terms of what our organization in particular does on a daily basis, we run a watercraft inspection program. We had 20 boat stewards across the region this summer, and our stewards go out to boat launches and the like, and they teach boaters and fisher people the importance of making sure their watercraft and equipment are cleaned, drained, and dried. This is a huge help in preventing the spread of aquatic invasive species. And this year, we're pleased to announce that they performed over 21,000 watercraft inspections and spoke with over 53,000 people. That's so many more than I did because I didn't leave my office all summer. So when we aren't in the middle of a pandemic, we usually attend outreach events. Uh, this includes different festivals, tabling at farmer's markets, giving presentations like this one, and just making sure that people know about invasive species in general, as well as what they specifically can do to prevent the spread of these species, such as making sure their watercrafts are clean, drained, and dried, making sure we aren't moving firewood, that we're planting native species, things like that. We also do a lot of early detection work. This includes going out and finding new infestations as quickly as possible. And the really cool part of this is that we use data previously collected on where we know certain invasive species grow best. We call this habitat suitability. And we combine this with some GIS magic, basically. And we can make really informed predictions about where we think new infestations are likely to appear in our area. And then we can go out and survey those areas to see if our predictions were indeed correct. And then lastly, we do a lot of manual and chemical removal of invasive species. Generally, we work on really important conservation lands that we want to protect and make sure they are resistant to the harm caused by invasive species. And our terrestrial project manager, Lucy, is great at making sure that we prioritize the invasive species in our area and we protect these really special local areas. So before we get any further, I know many of you are probably very familiar with the term invasive species. I just want to offer a quick definition just to clear up any misconceptions. So according to New York State, an invasive species is one that is firstly not native to the ecosystem under consideration and whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. So the main takeaway here is that a species must both be non-native and cause harm to be considered an invasive species. There are species like lilacs or apples or cows that are non-native to Western New York, but they actually do provide a benefit for us. So we can't technically consider these invasive. We also have a lot of native species that do cause harm. Sorry to have to tell you this, but poison ivy is unfortunately native. It does cause harm to us, and that's why we can't consider it to be an invasive species. The second part of this definition is that it must also cause harm. So there's a lot of different interpretations on what we consider harm. So we have economic harm. The picture in the top right here is a picture of a really tall sand which we'll talk about a little bit more later. 
You've undoubtedly seen this on roadsides, and if you haven't noticed it before, you're going to now, so my apologies in advance. What you can't tell from this photo is that there's actually a really nice pond behind it. And they've done studies where as Stragmites invades along a lake shore, you can actually see the property values diminish. No one wants to head up to the lake for the weekend, rent a lake house if you can't actually see the lake at all. So next up, we have environmental harm. The picture on the far left here shows an invasive species called myelomit. This is a very fast-growing vine that in the picture here has completely taken over the area and smothered any plants that were there before. So we have that environmental harm caused by creating a complete monoculture of just this species. We wipe out any native species in the area and doesn't provide that support for the food chain. And then lastly, we have harm caused to human health. This can be really obvious damage. You, you may have heard of the species called giant hogweed, which grows very, very tall, has a flower shape called an umbel, which looks like Queen Anne's lace. The sap of this plant can actually cause really terrible blisters on, if you get it on your skin. So this is a very obvious threat to human health. But we also have much more nuanced harms to human health. So the picture on the bottom right is a stand of dead hemlock trees. All those gray, ghostly looking trees are dead hemlock trees. And these were killed by the invasive species, the hemlock woolly adelgid, another species that we'll talk about a little bit more later. But hemlock trees, they play a really important role in filtering water. And by losing hemlock trees, we're losing this important ecosystem service where we're receiving free filtered water just from the environment doing what it's supposed to do. And a lot of these invasive species, they actually cause what we call kind of a trifecta of harm. So they cause harm across all three of these categories. Just continuing our conversation about hemlock woolly adelgid, so it causes that harm to human health by losing the water filtration services. But hemlock trees also provide a water cooling effect, which boosts brook trout fisheries. This is a really important fishery fish that's tied to tourism, so that has our economic harm there, as well as environmental damage. So you're losing those brook trout. And hemlock trees are actually a keystone species. They provide food and habitat for many, many other species, and their loss is felt across the ecosystem. So with that, we'll get into some identification. It's really easy to kind of assume that just because our plants are shedding their leaves for our, the winter, that our ability to identify invasive species is going to be very severely limited, if not impossible. For some species, this is definitely true. Lesser celandine, for instance, if we have any gardeners on the line, this is pretty much the bane of their existence. Lesser celandine appears very, very early in the spring. It's an ephemeral flower. And once it flowers, it dies back to just its underground tubers, and we can't see it for the rest of the year. So obviously, we're not going to be going out and looking for lesser celandine in the fall and winter. That being said, we do have a lot of species that are pretty easy to identify during the fall and winter months. And we actually have a few that are even easier to find during the winter. Hopefully, at the end of this presentation, you'll be ready to head out and look for invasive species year-round. So usually when we approach teaching people how to identify plants, we place a really big focus on the leaves, the flowers, and the fruiting bodies. During the dormant season, we may not necessarily have all of these identifiers available, but invasive plant builds do a good job of leaving their mark on the land that still allows us to easily identify invasive species infestations, even if there are a few inches of snow on the ground, not to bring that up too early. So the first thing we want to look for is leftover vegetative matter. This can include pieces of stems, seed heads, dried leaves. Some plants will either partly or fully dry up and persist year-round, making it easy, if not easier, to spot because we don't have all these other leaves obscuring our view of these species. We can also look at really distinctive bark. So this may seem very intimidating to begin identifying plants just based on the appearance of bark alone. So I promise to start you off easy and introduce you to very distinctive barks and twigs that will build your confidence up and get you more familiar with bark and twig ID. And then lastly for plants, we can also look at species that have fruit on their twigs year round. So looking at fruiting bodies is helpful regardless of the time of year and is a very helpful identifier to be on the lookout for when we get into the spring and summer months as well. And just for your own knowledge, I will add that one of the reasons that so many invasive species can be found using their persistent fruits 
is that despite many of these species having originally been planted intentionally for food for wildlife, the fruit of these invasive species is kind of out of sync with the nutritional needs of our native birds. Birds in western New York, they need a lot of protein in spring, they need carbs in the summer, fats for the fall, and then carbs and sugar over winter. The invasive plants that we have in the area don't really follow the same schedule. These birds and these plants haven't been communicating for thousands of years to kind of co-evolve together. So this can ultimately leave birds malnourished because they're not getting the right nutrients they need when they need them. So because of this, the fruits on invasive species are the least valuable to our birds and therefore stay on the shrubs throughout the winter as opposed to our native fruit producing plants, which are picked over much more quickly because they provide those better nutritional needs for our birds. So beyond just plants, we can also survey for a few insects. One in particular I'll discuss, the hemlock woolly adelgid, is active during the fall and winter, and this is actually the easiest time of year to identify it. So we'll get started with knotweed. In our area, this is usually Japanese knotweed, although there are several different species of knotweed in western New York. This is an herbaceous perennial plant. That means there's no woody vegetation on it. And during the growing season, it has really large leathery leaves and cascades of white flowers. In the fall and winter, it kind of goes dormant and leaves orangish reddish stems upright. Usually they're about four to 10 feet in height. And these stems are unique in that they're hollow all the way through. People often compare them to bamboo. And they're very easy and satisfying to break in half. If you get close to a stand of knotweed, you may be able to see the clusters of winged seeds. You can see these on the left-hand side here. And these stems are really easy to see in the winter, especially when you have snow in the background. It really makes this nice contrast to the orangish red coloration of the, the dried stems. And this species often grows along streams and roadsides, and you can really easily see it while driving, but please try not to get too distracted. In a very similar vein, we have Phragmites. We can also call this common reed. This is another herbaceous plant. It's a perennial grass, and it can grow very tall. It can grow between 3 and 15 feet tall. In the summer months and the spring months, it has green foliage and purple-brown plumes. These start off very purple in color. And then as they dry and they die back for the winter, um, all of the stems and the leaves and the seed heads dry out, and they take this take on this really characteristic tan gray color, depending on how long they've been out in the elements. Its seed heads in particular, as you can see on the right-hand side here, they get really fluffy in appearance. They're pretty soft to the touch. And very similar to knotweed, this is a common invader along roadsides and in ditches and other moist areas. And like I was saying before, I can almost guarantee you that you've seen this plant before, and if not, you will see it now. We can also see different species of hazel at this time of year. We have two main varieties in western New York, common teasel and cutleaf teasel. Common teasel, as the name suggests, is much more common, although cutleaf teasel is not an unknown species in this area. These are herbaceous biennials, so that means they generally grow for two years, and they can grow between two to six feet tall. During the growing season, they have very large, stiff leaves, and depending on the species, will either have entire leaves, as seen in the common teasel, or very lobed leaves, as seen in the cut leaf teasel. It looks like someone took that entire leaf and cut little notches in it. And the most distinctive feature on teasel is this spiky seed head. Many years ago, this was actually used to tease and card fibers in the textile industry. Its use for teasing fibers has earned it the name teasel. Pretty easy to remember and a fun fact. And during the growing season, all of these seed heads will produce many, many small purple or white flowers, depending on the species. And obviously, these seed heads are visible year-round and are attached to a stem covered in very small, sharp prickles. And this species is another one that's very common to find in abandoned fields. Swallowwort is, again, kind of lumped into species pale and black swallowwort. Both are herbaceous perennial vines. And these vines, you can often see them twisting along one another. So you can see several vines here all kind of twisting along one another and growing up, using each other as support. 
So during the growing season, they'll have dark green, glossy leaves, and they produce very small flowers. Some of them are pale in color. Some of them are very dark, rich purple, red, and that kind of allows us to distinguish between two species. In the fall and the winter, the vegetative matter dies back to leave these really brittle, tan vines. But the most distinctive feature of swallowwort in the fall and winter months is this very distinctive seed pod. Its seeds look very similar to milkweed seeds, if you're familiar with those at all. And these seed pods will often be split open like this, and you can see some of the seeds inside. Some of them have maybe fallen on the ground, depending how late in the season it is. But this is a pretty distinctive sight. So looking for these milkweed-like seeds and these really brittle tan vines that are twisting along one another. So the last species that I'm going to cover that leaves very obvious vegetative matter is called mugwort. This is, again, a perennial herbaceous plant, and this grows between two to five feet tall. During the growing season, its leaves are very dark green on top with a smooth top, and they have a silvery, hairy underside to it. These leaves often dry directly on the plant. And as you can see here, someone had just run their hand up the dried stalk of a mugwort plant and the leaves fell right off. And you can see they have a very dark brown, gray color on top with the very silvery white underside. It does produce large amounts of seed at the top of the plant. And again, these remain on year round. As you can see here, this is kind of at the end of the growing season, and the picture on the left here is in the middle of winter. Just very, very small little flower heads that do contain seeds in them. And I would recommend that if you are able to positively identify mugwort once, you can give the dried leaves a smell. They produce a really distinctive herby scent. Um, I've heard it compared to both sage and mums. So depending on your nose and, and what you usually smell, It'll smell a little bit different to everybody, but it is a very distinctive scent. And again, this is another invasive species that favors fields and disturbed areas. And I've actually seen it a lot along the sides of parking lots and such. Uh, we did get a question, uh, could you burn swallowwort in the fall or winter to get rid of it? Unfortunately not, just because a lot of, for, for all of these plants, uh, just because the above ground vegetative matter has died back doesn't mean that below ground, the roots and the rhizomes aren't preparing for spring to, to sprout back up. Invasive species are known for being very, very difficult to get rid of, and a lot of that power comes from the root systems and the rhizomes, and um, they're very difficult to kill without the use of herbicides. So unfortunately, no, we can't burn swallowwort. We actually don't have a good management for swallowwort, unfortunately. So our, our best suggestion is just to prevent it as much as possible. So we're going to move into bark and twig identification. So first up, we have Tree of Heaven. Uh, tree of Heaven is a very highly aggressive tree species. Even though it's called Tree of Heaven, you do not want it anywhere near your property, I can guarantee you. It produces massive amounts of seed, and it can actually send up specialized root tissues called suckers, depending on who you talk to. These will sprout an entirely new tree right next to the nearby parent tree. During the growing season, these have very large compound leaves, and when you break the, the leaf or a twig and smell it, it actually smells similar to peanut butter. Again, a cool parlor trick. However, during the fall and winter, this species can still be identified, and we can use its bark. The bark here, it looks very, very similar to the skin of a cantaloupe, a cantaloupe melon, and that's very distinctive for tree of heaven. Additionally, if you're able to find a twig, you can look for this what we call a leaf scar. So on Tree of Heaven, it's very large. It's almost the width of the twig itself, and it has a very distinctive V or heart shape to it. And this is just where the leaf itself used to be attached, but obviously has since shed for the fall season. Beyond these two identifiers, if you see a very large tree growing in a very urbanized area or growing right up along the foundation of a building, this is a very good chance that it is Tree of Heaven. This tree doesn't care if you have a sidewalk, and it's just going to destroy the sidewalk and grow anyway. So definitely one to keep a lookout for. And then so as not to overwhelm you with bark and twig talk, um, this is the final species that we'll identify just using these features. Uh, but bush honeysuckle is very common invasive shrub in western New York. 
So we kind of, again, lump all of these species into one. There are several species of honeysuckle that are invasive, but in order to identify them, you really need to key out their flowers, and it's really just not worth time. They're still managed the same way as any other species. So we kind of lump them all together and call them bush honeysuckles. These can grow very, very large, up to 15 feet tall, and during the, the summer months, they have pretty mundane leaves. They are slightly fuzzy in texture. They have entire margins. Their flowers are pretty distinctive. They can be white, pink, yellow, red, depending on the specific species. And eventually they go on to produce a very characteristic red or yellow fruit towards the end of summer. During the winter, however, obviously all of these identifiers are gone. The fruiting bodies do indeed fall off the honeysuckle before winter, so we can't really rely on that. However, we can look at the bark and twigs. The bark on large stems, usually at the base of the plant or just very large offshoots, will be very shaggy. It's not smooth at all. So that's one clue. If you find a multi-branched shrub that has very rough bark, that's a clue that it might be honeysuckle. Another key identifier is this hollow pit. This is just the center of the twig. So any twig that you cut from an invasive honeysuckle shrub will have this hollow portion running through it, regardless of the width of the twig cut. This one's just maybe half an inch in diameter. You could cut it right down at the base and it'd still have this hollow pith in it. We do have native honeysuckle shrubs, but this hollow pith is a dead giveaway that it is one of the invasive species. So this should be pretty easy to find. It's very common in the area and can easily be found in forests and abandoned fields. And with that, we can start to get into our persistent fruiting bodies and berries. Japanese barberry is another deciduous shrub. Many gardeners and landscapers are probably going to be familiar with it. It is a very common horticultural plant, and it can grow pretty large. It can grow up to eight feet tall if it does escape cultivation. Obviously, if you're pruning it regularly, it's probably not going to get up to eight feet tall. During the growing season, it'll have clusters of leaves that develop into really, really pretty red and orange fall foliage. I hate to give invasive plants compliments, but it does produce really pretty fall foliage. It has umbrella-shaped flowers that actually form on the underside of branches. And ultimately, these flowers will turn into these red oblong fruits pictured here. So these are a pretty dead giveaway that what you have is Japanese barberry, but one way or another, you can notice these very sharp thorns. They are not fun to touch. I would not recommend it, but they are pretty distinctive and will clue you in that you do have Japanese barberry. And then one last identifier, depending on the resolution you're able to view this PowerPoint presentation, these stems have these grooves along them. So that's one more characteristic that'll kind of clue you in and let you know that it's Japanese barberry. Again, this is very common in forest understories and disturbed areas. You may be noticing a theme. Invasive species love disturbed areas and are usually the, one of the first things to move in and take advantage of that free space. And then also continuing on our theme of thorny invasive shrubs, we have multiflora rose. Multiflora rose has really long arching canes or branches. They can grow up to 10 feet tall and kind of lean and climb on other foliage to get up higher. If the cane is on the ground, it can actually even root and start to produce a new plant. So this is a pretty unique way of growing. During the growing season, it's very easy to spot by its compound leaves that have very serrate margins. And it does produce really pretty white flowers in the late spring that obviously look like roses and they do actually have a lovely smell. Again, giving compliments to these invasive species, it's unavoidable sometimes. So eventually these flowers do produce really small rosebuds at the end of the branches, and these will appear in clusters of several fruits. Again, we do have native roses. These will actually produce larger rose hips. The native roses produce larger rose hips, and though they also appear in clusters at the tips of branches, they'll be in smaller bunches than the multiflora rose. And again, we can look out for these very stout, aggressive-looking thorns, just like on roses that you would grow in your garden. And this species is very common in pastures and, again, open canopies. We can also spot oriental bittersweet during the fall and winter months. 
This isn't a very common invasive species, but I also wouldn't be surprised if you came across it. It is a perennial deciduous vine, and it can grow up to 60 feet tall using nearby trees to grow up. During the growing season, it has very rounded leaves that can distinguish it from other vines like poison ivy or grapevine. Uh, but by far the easiest identifier is its fruit. Similar to many other species we've already discussed, Organo bittersweet does have a native look-alike. So here we have the native American bittersweet as compared to the invasive oriental bittersweet. And the difference is pretty clear. So you can see the native American bittersweet has this very darkish reddish-orange seed covered by a, a very orange covering. On the other hand, the invasive oriental bittersweet, the berry is pretty much the same shade, but it's covered by a much yellowish in color skin. So this is a pretty easy way to distinguish the two. If you're having trouble differentiating the difference between this outer layer of the fruit, you can also look at where the berries are on the stem. The native American bittersweet will only occur at the very tip of the twig or stem as opposed to the invasive oriental bittersweet, which can occur anywhere along the stem. And again, these are pretty characteristic of the plant and should be probably the only thing you really need to identify either one of these species. Again, this is common in disturbed woodlands and fields. And then our final example of species that have really persistent fruits is autumn olives. So this is another perennial shrub. And sometimes it can even reach height of kind of a small tree, up to 15 feet tall. Its leaves, when they're on the shrub, are pretty distinctive. They're oval or lance-shaped, and they have a really nice olive green colored top with a silvery underside. It produces very small yellow flowers that produce these clusters of red fruit. In addition to the fruit being red in color, you can also see that they're covered in very small silver specks. This, again, is very, very distinctive. If you see any berries like that, you're going to know that it's autumn olive. You can also look at the bark, and it's covered in these little spots called lenticels. This is another characteristic suggesting that you do have autumn olive. And pretty much the whole plant kind of has this metallic spot all over it, on the berries, on the leaves, on the twigs, and the bark. And lastly, this can also be found in grasslands and along forest edges. And the last species that I want to talk to you about today is hemlock woolly adelgid. So this species is very difficult to see with the naked eye because hemlock woolly adelgid is a very tiny aphid-like insect that's actually less than one sixteenth of an inch in length. This is going to be very difficult to see with the naked eye. However, fortunately for us, during the fall and winter months, they produce and encase themselves in this white ovisat or this woolly coating that makes them much easier to spot by the human eye. So an early infestation of hemlock woolly adelgid will just have a few of these woolly masses along the twig, on the underside of the twig, but as the infestation progresses, the majority of the needles on each twig will be able to support a tiny insect. As you can see here, the hemlock woolly adelgid puts its mouth part into the twig right at the base of the needle. And these are individual little hemlock woolly adelgid insects that have latched onto this hemlock tree. This is what they look like when they don't have that woolly coating. And as you can see, you're very zoomed in here. So looking for these with the naked eye would be very difficult. Beyond them being on the underside of each twig, we're also only going to be able to find these on hemlock trees. So in order to look for hemlock woolly adelgid, we also need to familiarize ourselves with hemlock trees in particular. Hemlock trees are pretty easy to identify. If you are not familiar with identifying evergreens or coniferous trees, most of them probably are just pine trees in your mind, but they are pretty easy to identify. So the first thing that can clue you in is that hemlock trees often grow along ravines and stream banks. So that's one key. Hemlock trees also have really flat, dark green needles. And this is the underside of the twig, and you can see each needle has kind of these two parallel white lines on the underside. This is very characteristic that you have a hemlock tree. 
as you can see, this hemlock tree is nice and healthy. There's no hemlock willia delgi on it, which is great. And I know I promised we wouldn't talk about bark anymore, but if you're far away and you can't get up close to each and every tree to look at the needles, you can also look at the bark. I'm going to tell you that the bark is kind of has a reddish hue to it. If you aren't familiar at looking at bark, it may take some time to get used to it. But if you compare it to the other nearby trees, it should click in your brain pretty quickly that this is much more reddish color than a lot of the other evergreen trees in the area. Lastly, hemlock trees also grow in stands. So usually when you find one, there are going to be a lot more nearby. So if you find one, you'll know to keep looking and that you'll be able to find one more and one more until you're completely surrounded by hemlocks. So if there's just one species out of all of these that I can encourage you to look for this winter, it would definitely be hemlock woolly adelgid. Hemlock trees, as I alluded to much earlier, are very important trees in western New York. They're one of New York State's most common tree species, but that doesn't diminish how important they are to us. Some luckily, Adelgia threatens to actually kill all of these trees, even though they're very tiny aphid-like insects. If you get a tree that's covered in thousands of them, they'll actually suck the life out of the tree. Thankfully, in western New York, in the surrounding area, this is still a pretty rare invasive species. There's still a lot that we can do to stop its spread, primarily just through reporting its existence. If you're out hiking this winter and you see a hemlock tree, take a few minutes and just check it out and make sure that there aren't any hemlock really adelgid on it. And if you do find some, you can report it either to Western New York Prism or you can report it to IMS Invasives. This is a citizen science program that I will talk on a little bit later. All right, so I know that was a lot of identification to throw at you. And hopefully I haven't depressed you all with all of the invasive species that are present in Western New York. But now comes the best part of any presentation is motivating people like you to take action and to help us prevent their spread further. These are all things that anyone can do. Some of them range from very easy to a little bit more difficult, but providing many more benefits. And I'd strongly encourage anyone to take these into consideration and kind of make them a part of your daily life. And they are very valuable in how you interact with the natural world in the future. So first of all, really simple step is don't use invasive species in floral arrangements, seasonal decor, wreaths, et cetera. And in order to help you do this, I would recommend just getting yourself familiar with some invasive species, fruits, as well as seed heads in your area. So this top left image, you can see this lovely evergreen wreath that someone put together. Unfortunately, they decided to put the seed heads of teasel in it. They look lovely. They add some interesting texture, but we don't want to be spreading invasive species with our seasonal wreaths. The top right image here, this is a wreath made entirely of oriental bittersweet vines and berries. Both of these wreaths I found just on blogs to offer tutorials on how you, too, can make similar items. Obviously, we don't want to be spreading invasive species through our seasonal wreaths. And so I would strongly recommend not including them in these demonstrations. And then lastly on the bottom, we have a now infamous rooster that was sold by a certain national chain. And the rooster's tail feathers are actually completely composed of seed heads of Phragmites. They marketed this rooster as natural, and I guess it is natural, but it is also highly invasive. Try not to use the seed producing bodies of plants that you know to be invasive in your seasonal decor. This is a pretty easy step, um, just making sure you're familiar with them so you can avoid using them or purchasing them in any of your home decor. And then lastly, if you're doing your best, but someone gives you a really nice oriental bittersweet wreath, uh, we would recommend not composting the item and instead of that, disposing it into a landfill-bound trash can. I love composting as much as the next person. But composting invasive species materials like this can only serve to further introduce the species into the natural environment and, again, provide some potential for future invasion. So try not to compost them. I know it's really difficult not to. Next up, this is a huge one. So I'm guessing that most everyone on this call here likes to engage in some kind of outdoor recreation. Invasive species love hitchhiking on people. Anyone going outside in the fall and winter be they, you know, a hiker, snowshoer, cross-country skier, hunter, snowmobile or ATV rider, 
or even just someone out walking a dog, you can play a huge role in preventing the spread of invasive species. So we encourage people to clean off their gear before and after each outing. It's something you may not necessarily think about, but very tiny seeds and other reproduction capable materials can get stuck in the tread of your boots and your shoes as you're walking along a trail or skiing along a trail, and then they fall off a little while later, either at that trail or maybe in a completely different area. And this may kind of seem like a far-fetched idea until you see just how many invasive species infestations are at the beginning of trailheads or just along the trails themselves. So next time you're out hiking or on a trail otherwise, take a look around you and look at what invasive species are there, and you're going to notice that so many of them either start or are exclusively along trails. To encourage people to clean off their footwear, you can either use a small cleaning brush, as pictured on the left here, or if you're lucky, you may be able to find one of Western Europe Prism's boot brush stations, as pictured in the center here. And you can hold on to the sign, read about invasive species, and brush your shoes off at the very same time. Just taking a few minutes to brush the mud and debris and seeds from your shoes has the potential to save large amounts of time and money on management, as well as making sure that your house stays clean when you get home. And we provide the same suggestion for anyone who is biking or using off-road recreational vehicles. We would encourage you to make sure your gear is nice and clean at the end of each trip. Again, it might not only prevent a new infestation from taking hold, but it can also save you wear and tear on your gear at the same time. In a very similar vein, if you're out enjoying the natural areas around you, do your best to stay on trails. I know it's really tempting to kind of go off trail either to explore, find a cool mushroom, or to navigate around a deep puddle. But by doing this, you're widening the trail. You can disturb native species that may be in the soil underneath. And you can also create disturbance. And as I said earlier, invasive species love disturbance. So you're creating a new possibility and opening up new area for invasive species to grow along that trail. So it's really important to avoid widening the trail not only for the maintenance of that trail, but also for the prevention of invasive species. And then lastly, if you're going out hiking with your pets, uh, most likely your dog or maybe a horse or something, you want to make sure that they are free of seeds and debris as well. So invasive species aren't picky. They will definitely hitch a ride on your animal and then can use them to invade into new areas. In the rightmost picture, um, this is Fagan. This is an invasive species sniffing dog. Him and his colleague, Dia, the detection dog, they have a really great Instagram page. If you want to check them out, they are at Dia Saves the Forest. I would highly recommend them. We're big fans here at Western New York Prism. Uh, but anyway, you can see in this picture uh, with Bacon that he actually does have some small seeds on his leg here. You want to make sure that your animal is free of debris and seeds, not only checking their fur that's easily visible, but also checking their paws and their feet make sure they don't have anything stuck between their toes. And I know at first that these habits are going to seem like a lot to remember. Um, I would recommend just putting a small brush in your backpack. I have one in my hiking backpack. It always stays in there. Same thing with my ticket kit. So I'm sure to never forget either of them. And it really quickly becomes a habit to just clean off your gear before and after each use. And this is something I mentioned a little bit earlier about being able to report invasive species. So when you're out and about recreating outdoors, this is a really great tool to use. It's called IMAP Invasive. And this allows you to document the invasive species that you find. This is a citizen or community science initiative that allows anyone to contribute to meaningful scientific data. Many citizen and community scientists use the IMAP Invasive app to easily collect observations in the field. And the best part about this is that you don't need access to your cell service, your Wi-Fi while you're out in the field, but you can upload your observations once you get home and you have access to Wi-Fi either at your home or a public location. All of the data that's collected through this app is added to a public database of invasive species observations that covers both the United States and Canada as well as, as, well as other parts of North America. And this is a sample of all of the invasive species observations in the Buffalo area. This is a wealth of information, and if you are interested, definitely check them out. You can use the public map to either find your house or your favorite recreation area. 
and discover what invasive species are around you. If there aren't any on the map, you can also go out and map them yourself and participate and get more data on this map. It's a really interesting and helpful tool that invasive species managers and educators and even myself use all the time. If you are interested in learning more about this program, Western Europe PRISM does periodically offer IMAP Invasives training webinars and the like. If you can't wait that long and you want to learn more about it right now, you can either download the app directly and just play around with it. It's pretty intuitive. If you're not a tech person and you need a little more help, I would recommend going to NY, imapinvasive.org, and they have a lot of great tutorials that can walk you through the mobile app as well as how to navigate the public database map as well. Again, both are fairly intuitive, but if you're a little more uncomfortable with technology, I would definitely recommend checking out their tutorials. And then lastly, just beyond preventing invasive species from hitchhiking on you or reporting invasive species, you can take it one step further. And I would actively encourage you to manage invasive species infestations. Well, management may not necessarily sound like a means to prevent spread of new infestations. By managing existing infestations, you can get rid of this seed source that may be getting moved around and contributing to new invasive species infestations. So by removing these seed sources, you can help prevent and slow the spread of invasive species. Beyond that, managing existing invasive species infestation is also really great for creating habitat for native species, especially pollinators. It contributes, like I said, to all of those ecosystem services. So beyond just preventing the spread of invasive species, it also has a lot of other benefits, too. Western Prism has a lot of best management practices on our website. I would encourage you to take advantage of them if you're interested in learning about how to begin managing some of Western New York's worst offenders. We're also going to add a few more in the coming months. If you don't have your own land, please don't vigilante manage invasive species. There are a lot of organizations that take volunteers to help them manage invasive species. I think Brian Woods still has a Fragmites Strike Force. I know the West York Land Conservancy just did a volunteer day. West York Prism occasionally does volunteer days as well. So if you're interested in this, reach out, and I can point you in the direction of some of these volunteer opportunities. And then if you are interested in getting started right away, we do have another webinar coming up in a few weeks, and that's going to focus specifically on managing woody invasive species in the fall and winter. So if you can't wait to get started managing them, this is a great opportunity to learn what you can do right now. And like I said, this webinar is upcoming. It will be on Thursday, November 12th, at the same time as today's webinar, 2 to 3 p.m., and we'll focus on woody shrubs like bush honeysuckle, multiple rose, autumn olive, and several others that we didn't get a chance to touch on today. And with that, I will close out our presentation. We do have four additional presentations planned in the coming weeks, including invasive forest pests, one on invasive agricultural pests, specifically European cherry fruit fly and plum pox disease. Like I said, we have the Woody Invasive Species Management webinar, one on emerging aquatic threats in Western New York. We are taking a break next week from our webinars to host our fall partner meeting, which anyone is able to join. We will discuss the summer projects that we've had going on, as well as some of the early detection species that we've recently found in Western New York. I would also like to take some time to encourage any of you to follow us on social media if you're not already. We regularly post on Facebook and Instagram. We have Invasive Species of the Week if you want to learn more about the invasive species in Western New York. And we're currently growing our collection of videos on YouTube. There is my email address on the bottom here. If you think of any questions or you would like a copy of this presentation, feel free to send that to me. Well, if anyone thinks of any, Additional questions, feel free to message us on social media. Feel free to send me an email. And thank you all so much for taking the time out of your day today to learn more about invasive species, identifying them in the fall and winter months. Um, I hope you all learned something and can go out and report things in the coming months. And have a fantastic day. Thank you all so much. <laughs>